Welcome to pop-up presentations. We're doing that every time. <laughs> I'm Evan. This is Steve. Today, we're talking about going from kickoff to robot concept, the engineering design process, and what the first week of build season looks like for Jack and the Bot. Um, so I've been a mentor since 2007, Steve since 2008. Um, we joined Jack and the Bot last season, but these are pretty standard processes. This is the process that Jack and the Bot used last year, but it's been refined from experiences that Jack and the Bot's had in the past and other mentors from other teams that joined recently have also brought. Okay, so let's start with an overview of what the engineering design process is. The basic steps, step one, define the problem. Step two, do your basic research, background research. Step three, specify your requirements. Then brainstorm, evaluate, and choose a solution. Develop and prototype the solution. Test the solution, and then determine if your solution meets the requirements. And very likely, it doesn't. Maybe not all of them, maybe just some of them, maybe none of them. Um, and then you go back to the appropriate step between brainstorm, develop, and test, and do that again iteratively until you get a solution, or in this case, we're talking about a robot, that meets all the requirements. And then the last step is to communicate the results. So what does that look like in the process of FRC? So with the first robot, what defines our problem is the game rules, right? The points, the penalties, how we rank, um, and then usually team goals are also part of that, right? What is it that our team is trying to achieve competitively on the field? Um, it's going to be a different answer for what problem we're trying to solve if we're building a robot to try and compete at the highest levels of the world championship versus a robot that maybe we're just trying to qualify for a district championship or, um, you know, be picked for playoffs at a regional. Background research. This is where the strategic analysis comes in, comparisons to previous games, previous robots that um, other teams or our team has built that maybe solve similar challenges or similar problems, um, <clears throat> as well as, um, you know, our strategy breakdown, what, what we're trying to, how we think the best way to play the game is. Specifying the requirements, that's our priority list, right? This is us saying, here's how we're going to play the game, um, and maybe going even further into details of these are the systems that our robot's going to have um, and how those systems need to function. So that's a function of both the robot and the game rules, our team's best practices, our team's resource levels, et cetera, all come together for us to say, these are the requirements of the robot, of the solution that we're going to try and build in order to solve this competition challenge problem. Then we start the ideation, whiteboard, Crayola CAD, sketches, whatever it is, any ideas, get them onto paper, virtual or real, um, <clears throat> start figuring out the architecture concepts. At a high level, what are the different subsystems that a robot's going to have and how are they going to fit together to satisfy those requirements that we've developed? Then we'll do prototyping, right? Are there questions that we need to answer about how the game pieces behave, about um, how the field functions, whatever it is that we need to try and prototype to understand, and um, <clears throat> also laying out primary geometry um, some other teams call this by uh, other names like master geometry or um, core geometry or whatever. It's basically the CAD layout, right? The high level CAD 2D sketch usually that says here is everything to scale that our robot is going to um, be. We get into our detailed design, right? All of the 3D parts, how everything fits together, come out with a final CAD model. Um, release it for manufacturing, uh, and then actually build the robot, right? And then testing solutions. So I mentioned an iterative process, right? If we prototype, we're also going to test those prototypes, right? Determine whether or not the concept that we've come up with is going to meet our requirements, not meet our requirements. Maybe it doesn't meet our requirements, but we think that we could make it meet our requirements. Whatever it is, we're testing our prototypes, we're taking those lessons, and we're feeding them back into our actual design process. And of course, once we have the real robot, then we're going to test the robot, bring it up, um, test all the different scoring features, take it to our local practice field, run actual match cycles, um, 
find out what breaks and what doesn't work the way that we want it to and maybe even redesign. Um, and there's, uh, there's actually quite a bit of redesign that usually happens. Um, some of it on a, on a larger scale, some of it on a smaller scale, but basically no robot is perfect out of the box. Um, so how do we know if our solution meets our requirements? So we're going to have a discussion as an engineering team at various points in the process of whether the concept that we're building towards and then the built robot that we end up with um, actually satisfies the requirements that we've set for ourselves. Um, and then driver practice, of course, actually seeing the robot um, run on the field and do the things that we've designed it to do and hopefully it works the way that we intend it to um, and that's sort of our validation that the robot does meet the requirements um, and then the communicate results section <clears throat> we pass inspection right hey we've built a legal robot for the first robotics competition excellent um, and then actually competing on the field right that's a way of communicating our results how the robot performs in matches um, not necessarily directly correlated to whether we win or lose, but certainly correlated to whether it's playing the game the way that we intended to play the game and scoring as many points as we're intending to score from our earlier strategy analysis. And then as we go through the season, we're continuing to loop back through these <clears throat> last three or four steps as we repair the robot at competition, um, iterate, through new designs, etc. Okay, so now here's where I'm going to take a break from FRC robots and talk a little bit about how this lines up with what I do in the real world, which is um, help design airplanes for the Boeing company. So I work on uh, the thrust reverser system, um, specifically on the certification of the thrust reverser system for Boeing commercial airplanes. And we go through the exact same process but with airplanes. So for us, defining the problem comes from federal regulations um, and guidance on that. It comes from what the airplane needs, the controllability, the desired runway operation, things that the thrust reverser, which is attached to the engine um, and helps the airplane slow down. Um, you know, those are requirements that we, that we get. There's a problem that we're trying to solve. There's a mission that the airplane is designed to operate on. Um, we do our background research, successful previous designs, enterprise lessons learned, um, advanced development projects that have uh, fed, made their way into what actually is, you know, uh, commercial ready technology. Our system requirements are coming from federal aviation regulations. EASA is the European equivalent of that, um, what the airplane needs, um, and then Boeing best practices, right, what we've learned from the over 100 years of building commercial airplanes. When we do our brainstorming, evaluation, and solution selection, we're looking at trade studies, we're defining our system architecture, and we're defining our subsystem requirements there, um, possibly ones that go out to suppliers, etc. cetera. Right? <clears throat> we're gonna, there's going to be CAD. I don't work with CAD in my uh, regular job, but there's a lot of people that do um, to lay out how the system is going to go together. Um, we get suppliers that pro bid proposals, and then we select from those suppliers based on their proposals and which ones meet the requirements. We go test the components. There's a whole bunch of component and airplane level um, and engine level testing that gets performed, um, as well as a bunch of analysis that all goes into uh, <clears throat> what is our solution and the certification reports that go along with that safety analyses, documents, other things that Boeing provides to the FAA um, or EASA to demonstrate that our airplane is compliant to the regulations. And then we submit those documents to um, the regulators for approval. And once we get that approval that the airplane that we've designed is uh, meets all the requirements, right? So it needs to meet the Boeing requirements for how the airplane needs to operate in, you know, in the world for our customers. Um, as well as the regulatory requirements to ensure that it's safe. Um, and then once we get all that, we deliver the airplanes to the customers. So the exact same process, um, different, uh, you know, obviously different technical details, but 
all the way through, it's it's the engineering design process, and we're doing that in FRC um, just in our own our own little uh, competition. And the last step is, of course, once the airplanes are out and flying, um, we find issues. Sometimes they're safety issues. Sometimes they're just economic issues. Um, where you know parts are wearing out more quickly than uh, we intended, and so we have to do some redesigns um, or otherwise come up with new solutions to make the airplane perform the way that it's intended to perform um, when it may be the original design was a little bit lacking. So what does the timeline look like in FRC? So again, coming from the same process, starting at kickoff, um, you should have your team goals before kickoff, um, not really the topic of this particular uh, presentation, but uh, that's an activity that I would recommend your team engage in before kickoff so that you all are aligned on what your season goal is competitively, right? You can have non-competitive goals, et cetera, but, um, you know, what is your team trying to build your robot to achieve on the field? And then we get the game rules on kickoff. And the first weekend, we're really doing the first, you know, one and a half steps. Um, look at the game rules, do the strategy analysis, look at, do our background research, looking at prior robots, start to develop our strategy priorities, maybe not our complete requirements at that point. And then the first week is really where we're doing our brainstorming, do it, defining more detailed requirements, um, and trying to solidify on a concept and architecture an overall idea of what the robot that we're going to build will be. And then through the next four to six weeks, um, well, the first four to six weeks, right, we're um, prototyping, we're doing our detailed design, we're building our robot, we're testing our prototypes, and then eventually we're testing our robot and starting to get into the actual driver practice um, and more long form um, testing where we're trying to run as, as many hours as we can, both for our own benefit as you know our driver's benefit um, but also so that we can get ahead of any failures that we might encounter and try and fix those before we get to our competition and we get to competition right so um, at some point we'll have a discussion um, determine that the robot that we have is what we want it to be or maybe we'll decide that we've got some future plans for upgrades because it's not quite where we we think it needs to be for our goals um, we're practicing, we get to our competition, we pass inspection, we compete, we repair the robot as it breaks, and then we come back and we iterate on it to try and make it better and better and better through the season. So the key, one of the key takeaways from this is that the strategy that we select defines the design, right? That's the way the process is laid out. The robot that we uh, design is based on the strategy that we pick, not the other way around. We don't decide what kind of robot we want to build and then figure out how it should play the game. We figure out what the optimal way to play the game is based on our resources, our goals, our knowledge, etc. And then we figure out what the best robot architecture and robot design is to achieve that. Different strategic choices, different priorities are going to result in different robots, right? Um, so it's really important that we have those figured out first because we could end up, uh, we wanna make sure that we end up picking um, the right strategy for our team and then designing the robot that goes with it. Um, picking the right strategy is really important, but there's also many examples of teams, um, you know, or there's many examples of teams that designed robots that were very good at the wrong thing. Right. So um, some maybe extreme examples. Uh, in 2017, we had the high boiler and the low boiler for fuel. And fuel ultimately ended up being not very powerful, except in very specific circumstances. But the low boiler in particular, during autonomous, every three fuel that you scored was worth one point. And during the teleoperated portion of the match, every nine fuel that you scored was worth one point. Um, and the hoppers on the side of the field contained um, 50 balls each. Two of them would trigger at a time as 100 balls, right? So you figure you could build a robot that takes all 100 of those balls and goes and scores them in the low boiler, and you'll get, like, 11 points, right? Whereas basically every other action that you could do in that game would gain you somewhere between 40 and 50 points. You know, there was weird break points, but the point remains that 
there were teams that built robots that were quite good at scoring in the low boiler, and it just didn't matter at all, right? So understanding, you know, picking your strategy is important. Um, and, and to be clear, there are good reasons to have that functionality potentially anyway um, for like tiebreaker type things because it was really easy to get ties because all of the other um, robot functions are, or, or scoring functions are um, 40 or 50 points. But uh, designing around being able to score more than like nine, the nine you needed, um, or start with enough to be able to score three and get one point in autonomous um, really wasn't going to, to get you any benefit. Um, but picking the right strategy isn't everything, right? Um, you can, there's lots of examples and I'm, I'm not gonna go into detail, but there's lots of examples of robots that had the right strategy in mind, but they were designed poorly, right? They, the team wasn't capable of designing a robot that could actually execute that strategy. Um, and so it's like, well, you have the right idea, but, but the robot doesn't actually do that. Um, and there's also a lot of examples of robots that were successful playing strategies that they weren't designed for initially, right? They designed the robot to do one thing, they start playing the game, they realize that this robot's really good at doing something else, um, and so they do that. I think the most, the most famous example of this is probably 254 Cheesy Poofs in 2014. Um, their core strategy that year was to be the midfielder, to be the robot that... Um, trust the ball, right, threw the ball over the truss. Um, and they developed this brilliant wheeled shooter with um, intakes on both sides of the robot. And it turns out that the architecture they developed was far and away the, the best robot at putting the ball in the goal at the end of the cycle, bar none. Um, and so eventually that's what they doubled down on. They just said, all right, we're, we're the best at this. And clearly it's really good way to for us to play the game and they I mean they dominated that year um, they dominated the world championship so you know obviously that was a robot that was capable of fulfilling multiple roles on the alliance um, but they you know they went into the um, season intending to be a particular role on the alliance and it turned out that their robot was so much better at playing this other role than everybody else that that was just the thing that they needed to do in order to be successful that season so the other key aspect is that robot design is system design so when we talk about design a lot of the times we're talking about you know you have a cad team you have a design team it's the mechanical team, right? You're defining the mechanical robot. Um, but the robot itself is a system. It's got electronics, it's got software. Um, it has to be able to be controlled. Um, and so when we talk about things like simple design, um, that can only exist at a system level. We can have a mechanically simple design that is incredibly hard to control. We can also have a mechanically complex design that makes the software control really simple, right? Is either of those a simple design? It depends, right? I could make an argument that either of those is a simple design. I could make an argument that either of them is a complex design. Um, really, it's the combination of the two and the balance between the two that gives you the functionality that you need in the most, you know, maybe elegant way possible. That's really what we are striving for when we talk about simple design. So some examples of that. Um, 971 in 2014 <clears throat> had um, a claw that was mechanically very simple and from a software standpoint, extremely complex. Um, so here we can see the robot shooting at autonomous. It looks largely like a normal robot. It's got some top rollers. It's got some bottom uh, sticks. It picks up <clears throat> uh, the ball and it shoots it. Um, but the critical aspect of it is that the top rollers and the bottom sticks um, are mechanically not connected on rotation. Um, and we'll see that here as they move the arm around, um, <clears throat> that each of those is fully independent of each other. So from a mechanical standpoint, that's very simple. They've basically got the exact same system on top and bottom. They don't have to worry about a connection between the two of them. You just build it really stout um, <clears throat> and you can control it. But from a software standpoint, 
you have to make sure that when you're moving that those two stay moving in sync within some degree of tolerance otherwise uh you're gonna let go of the ball right because the bottom one moves too quickly um, or you're gonna over constrain it and crush the ball or break something on your robot or you know who knows what um, so we can watch this again and it looks like it moves as one unit and that is due to the incredible software control that was frankly far ahead of its time um, that enabled them to do this. From a mechanical standpoint, these are just two independent arms, right? Um, so a lot more, a lot simpler than uh, a system that had similar functionality in terms of the way that it was able to store um, or, or do other things like we see here where they can catch a bouncing ball. Um, so on the other side of the spectrum is um, 118 Robonauts uh, ball indexer in 2020. Um, so these balls famously, um, the yellow poof balls, did not want to touch each other. If they touch each other, they would just jam everything up. So um, a lot of teams had beam breaks or other sensors that enabled them to space the balls out. Robonauts had this like loose belt system um, <clears throat> with captured rollers and then spring clutches on the rollers such that when the first ball reached the end of the um, track, it would get held up by um, a wall or an escapement um, and it would stop. And those rollers would actually stop spinning, but the rest of the system would continue spinning. And so they could continue to feed more and more balls into this just by running the motor continuously and the balls would stack up and not try and, you know, absorb into each other or otherwise do whatever those balls like to do that year. Um, so here's kind of a hand demonstration. Back. Anyways, um, the 118 Robonauts 2020 indexer, um, incredibly mechanically complex solution um, using basically custom spring clutch system that they've tuned so that, um, you know, when the ball stacks up, the roller stops spinning. But then when you let you, know, you remove the blockage and let the balls through. It actually has enough force to power it. Um, you can go watch the full um, behind the bumpers video um, for for their explanation of it. You know, I just replayed a snippet of it to try and visualize what it was. But um, again, from a software standpoint, that is probably the simplest indexer of any team that year. Um, it is one motor, and it just they just say run motor forward. Uh, and, and all the balls stack up and then they release the, um, the escapement and they run the motor forward and all the balls go into the shooter. So our week one focus is on the whole, whole robot architecture decisions. How many degrees of freedom are we gonna have? How does it integrate um, with the rest of the robot? What are our starting configuration? Is it different than a stowed or you know, transit across the field configuration? Um, in order to do this, an understanding of the mechanical factors and controllability is really important. Um, and that continues to be important as we get into the detailed design, but we have to understand those at the outset because we need to be able to set ourselves up for success by picking systems and designs that we're going to be able to control the way that we want. So those are factors like stiffness, backlash, inertia, counterbalance, um, those kinds of things. Um, there's a really good resource, 971's 2018 Spartan Series presentation on mechanical design for controllability. Highly recommend it. Um, I think we're going to post the, 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 these presentation slides after as well with the, all the links and stuff. Um, uh, they actually just recently released a 2023 version of it where they talk through um, some updates and some applications of those principles on their 2023 robot, which is really cool. Um, <clears throat> but the basics are all in that original 2018 video. It's also really important to understand our team's software capabilities. What kinds of things can we rely on being software controlled um, to the level of precision and speed that we need them to be? Um, how many motorized or, or term is servoed degrees of freedom, um, do we have the capacity as a team to tune, right? We can put this giant, you know, multi-jointed arm with an extra intake and et cetera together, um, but if we don't have the capability as a team to actually tune each of those um, motorized systems to be as fast and precise and reliable as we need them to be, um, we're not going to be able to make the robot perform the way that we intend. 
right? So um, we talked uh, in our last presentation about uh, past Jack and the Bot robots um, that we had pneumatics on a lot of um, systems. Um, pneumatics are great for simple control of two position mechanisms. We don't have to worry about tuning a, a motor um, or a whole bunch of other factors in there, um, especially about stiffness and mechanical power transference stuff. Um, it just becomes a lot simpler, right? There's trade-offs there, but as a team, those are the trade-offs that we need to understand so that we can select an architecture that represents a robot that we can successfully build. So the influences um, on robot design, right? Strategy and rules. Um, there's usability. That's sort of nebulously defined in terms of how easy is it for our drive team to operate the robot on the field. Um, if we did make a robot that's really difficult for them to operate or uh, really difficult for them to go pick up game pieces, etc., that's probably not going to lead us on a successful path. Um, the manufacturability of the design, the maintainability of the design when things break, um, controllability, those influences that we just talked about, um, as well as CAD in this case, like does it physically fit in the space that we need it to? Um, that's important. We can't break the laws of physics in robots. Um, and then the engineering analysis there, which varies depending on the kind of system um, that we're doing, but uh, at a very basic level, um, we're doing motor motor calculations to determine what kind of gear ratios, reductions, how many motors we need to put um, on each uh, axis. Um, pneumatic calculations to figure out which to figure out what size uh, pneumatic cylinder we need to have enough force um, to to achieve what we're trying to achieve. Um, so this is a pretty good break point. We'll see take some questions um, on the overall design process uh, before we move on into detail requirements. How do you structure your design? Do you have a group of people working on the robot as a whole or subdivided teams working on each main component? Yeah. And if so, how do they do Yeah, so I'll repeat the question just in case you couldn't hear it, but it's a question about how we organize our design team um, and whether we have a bunch of people that are just working on the overall robot as a whole versus um, splitting up by subsystem, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> so we do split up um, by subsystem. We give... Um, we usually have one student, um, at least one student identified as being lead responsible for each of the subsystems that we define. But um, when we're in the early stages, it's a group effort. So we haven't defined any subsystems yet um, specifically. Um, so the first week, we're kind of all throwing ideas at the wall, putting sketches or whatever um, we have together, developing our requirements. Um, and uh, the primary geometry that we develop um, at the end of the day is usually one or two of our lead students are really driving that initial primary geometry development um, just because it's easier to have one person that's sort of in control of the CAD. But um, we get together in a room, um, have it up on the screen, and just talk through all of the decisions um, as we're going through that. Um, and then as we get later in the season, um, yeah, there's, there's at least one student that's sort of maintains primary responsibility um, as well as overall leads um, that are responsible for the integration. Um, and then the mentors kind of float around. Um, usually we'll have a mentor that's uh, or two that are, you know, they'll take on a, one or two of the subsystems as sort of their primary responsibility to oversee. Um, but uh, we, you know, we float around as needed. Um, and really, we're trying to make sure to facil we're facilitating those integration discussions, um, not just with the design team, but also with the software team um, as the design's progressing. You know, here's where we think the cameras are going to be able to go. Um, we're not going to be able to put the sensor, you know, that you wanted on this thing. Is this alternate uh, option uh, a possibility? That kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah, good question. How involved is programming in the robot concepts and robot design? Um, so this is something that we're actually actively revisiting this season. Um, in past years, the um, design concept has normally come from the CAD team. Um, and then programming basically gets asked for a list of like sensors and things that they want integrated. Um, and they provide that back to design. And then we've tried to integrate that. Um, and there's been, you know, some back and forth that has to happen. Um, I think for in the future, what we've found is that that um, 
a lot of the times that programming list doesn't get adhered to very well. Um, and so there's an inherent understanding on some of the design side, especially mentors uh, discussing of, of what we can and can't get away with on a software side. But from a whole team integration standpoint, that hasn't been um, as smooth as we'd like. So I think we're going to be making a more concerted effort to have sort of more regular integration meetings in those early um, days and weeks. Um, but software software is involved. Um, and I think we're moving in the direction of software being more involved in those initial discussions um, of what what we want. Um, and I guess I'll just to clarify as well, when we're doing our strategic analysis, that's a whole team exercise, right? So our, our priority list from a strategy standpoint isn't by sub team. Um, it's, it's not really until after we've developed that that um, we really start breaking out into our sub teams and, and focusing on our individual areas, whether it's prototyping or design or, or software development. Okay. So now we're going to talk about requirements. Um, and good design comes from good requirements. Good requirements define what is an acceptable solution, but do not overly constrain the solution options, right? So this is saying something like, we need an elevator, which says what your solution is versus we need to score cones on all level of the grid. That doesn't specify that it's going to be an elevator or an arm, but it is a functional requirement that says any solution we come up with must be able to do this, right? So it's what the robot needs to do, not how it should do it. And we further can break out requirements into sort of two levels. There's the high level or what's often referred to as functional requirements. And then there's detailed or system level requirements. So our high level um, requirements are defining the game plan. The robot functions. <clears throat> this is coming from our kickoff game analysis, also known as strategic design. Not going into that in this topic. Um, there's a lot of really good resources. Citrus's uh, 2022 workshops, they've got strategic design and game analysis, um, as well as Karthik's Effective First Strategies that's been a staple for uh, well, over a decade at this point. Um, but that's how you break down a game and determine what are the important aspects that, um, you know, functions that your robot needs to be able to do. Um, but then there's the detailed requirements or the system requirements. Um, that really refine and define what the acceptable design solution space is. Um, and this is what allows the team to evaluate robot design choices and trade-offs. So high-level requirements, this is often referred to as a needs, wants, or a priority list. Right? This is how do we intend to play the game. These are the robot-level functions. The robot must be able to pick up a cube from the ground. Okay, that's a thing, that's a function that the robot will be able to do. It's not usually enough as to have just high level requirements in terms of defining our robot systems, um, but this absolutely should be connecting back to a team level competitive goal. Whether that's we want to win our district championship, we want to qualify for the championship, we want to be an alliance captain in an event, something like that, right? This is defining the level of play that you're aiming to achieve and therefore will feed into what kinds of functions your robot and capabilities your robot needs to have. So here's some examples. Um, this is from 2017 Robonauts. Um, they make what they call the will list every year. Um, this specifies what their robot will. There's kind of a mix of high level and detailed requirements here. I'm gonna skip over mobility because that's all not really requirements. <clears throat> um, but um, gears, so they start with uh, gears. They're gonna pick up gears off the ground. Great, that's a functional requirement. They're gonna score gears on all three of the pegs. Cool. That's also a functional requirement. They're going to shoot balls in the high um, goal. That's a great functional requirement. They're going to intake balls from the ground. They're going to accept balls directly from the hopper or the human player. Um, the, the last three here gets more into the detailed type requirements in terms of how quickly they're going to shoot balls, how many they're going to be able to hold, um, and where they're going to shoot from. Um, so I would consider those less functional um, because it's not defining a function, but it's defining more about how they are going to achieve that function or other restrictions on it. Um, similarly, hang, climb. Climbing is a function. Less than five seconds, that's starting to get into the detailed aspects. Um, and then some autonomous functions as well, um, which Steve will get into a little bit later, breaking down the autonomous mode specifically. 
but I always recommend having something um, related to the autonomous mode in the functional requirements um, because it's you have to do it. Um, so it may, you, you should have requirements because usually fairly unique um, in terms of what needs to be done in autonomous separately from maybe what's done in the rest of the match. Um, so this was our 2023 priority list. Um, this is also in our tech binder that we released. So um, if you want to go look there, it's the same, it's the same stuff. Um, so we had a must have, a nice to have, and no. Um, and I'll get to no at the end. But um, our must have omnidirectional movement, um, scoring on all levels, uh, cones and cubes. Um, the less than one second, it was kind of a reference. It's not really a functional requirement. It's more of a detailed requirement. Um, we're going to be able to balance on the charge station in auto and teleop with a buddy. In this case, we're not talking about a buddy climb. We're just talking about being able to share the charge station with at least one more team. Pick up cubes off the ground. Five second auto cycles. So that's from our autonomous analysis that um, we're going to talk more in detail on later. Um, we're going to have a touch it, own it intake for cubes and for upright cones from the floor and the portal. Uh, we're going to be capable of doing a triple climb. We wanted to be immovable on command. That was so that we could stay on a charge station that wasn't level. Um, and we want to be able to traverse the charge station. So functionally, we need to be able to go over the charge station somehow. Our nice to have was any orientation cones and being able to traverse the charge station while traveling at, at speed, right? So in this case, quickly, um, we were able to do that. And our no here, we had direct acceptance. Um, this is talking about from the single substation chute um, and multi-piece handling. So the rules allowed for robots to handle multiple game pieces in the community and in um, the loading zone, um, but not between. So uh, we decided in this no, this isn't saying that a robot won't be capable of doing this, but it is saying that we are not going to design the robot to be capable of doing this. Um, and in fact, we didn't do either of these. Um, Multi-piece was something that we would probably have had to have specifically designed around. Um, our robot was certainly capable of having positions where we could directly accept game pieces from the single substation, um, but we never developed those um, because it wasn't part of our game plan. Um, then we've got a little box down the bottom about interesting um, for balancing the power station while we weren't um, actually on it, as well as side climbing. Those were things that we either weren't sure were physically possible or weren't sure were legal um, on kickoff day. So we put it in the interesting box. Um, and, and, and eventually, um, we did put the side climb into our nice to haves um, briefly before deciding that we actually weren't going to pursue it any further. Sorry, Ben. Um, so here's another look at an excerpt going over something similar from um, OP Robotics 2056. Um, and their <clears throat> presentation on 2056 ways to maximize your on-field performance. Um, similarly, they've got a functional, this is for the 2020 game, they've got their functional requirement breakdown, right? These are the functions that the robot's going to be able to do. I crossed out travel under the control panel because they ended up not choosing not to do that. Um, and then they have non-functional requirements, which is kind of this mishmash of sort of objectives in terms of being simple, robust, and effective, as well as some what I would call detailed requirements about holding five balls, um, shooting them in less than two seconds, et cetera, right? Um, different teams are going to approach this slightly different ways. There's not really a wrong way to do this, um, but it's extremely helpful to think about. So then we get into our detailed requirements. This is how fast, what's the game piece orientation, what's the direction of travel, um, things about maintainability, reliability, starting configuration, all of those details that get you from these are the functions the robot's going to have to this is the solution space that we can work within that's going to produce a design um, that will achieve our goals. Right? How fast does the robot need to score cones and cubes? How fast does the appendage have to move full travel? Um, how much weight does it need to lift? Uh, what cone orientations need to be collected? So this is where you take all your great design ideas and you put them aside. And you start asking the what if questions, right? What if we came up with a great design that couldn't collect while the robot was moving? Um, so there were a number of teams this year that were extremely successful using non-roller claws. Um, Code Orange probably being the most successful of them um, getting to Einstein last year. 
just a simple pinchy grabber, right? Um, that basically couldn't collect anything while moving. It would just kick the, uh, while the robot's moving, it would just kick it away, right? But they had a lot of, going back to simple design and uh, is a system thing, they had a lot of really um, involved software that allowed them to track where they were going, um, automate a lot of that motion, et cetera, right? But that's a solution that we wouldn't necessarily come up with if we have a requirement that the robot has to be able to pick up game pieces while it's moving at full speed, right? Um, is that a requirement or not? That's up to you to decide. Um, what if you have a great collector that can't reach a game piece that's in the field corner, right? Is that a problem? Maybe you say, no, it's not gonna happen that often, um, or there's enough other game pieces around that that's not a requirement that we're gonna put on ourselves. Or you might say, you know what, looking at this field, all of the game pieces are just gonna end up collecting in the corner. We have to be able to do that, right? Two different ways that you could go, put it in a requirement. What if you make a design that can't hold the game piece inside the frame perimeter? So fun fact, the Jack and the Bot robot does not store inside the frame perimeter when the arm is down. It's within the bumpers, but um, the arm is actually sticking slightly past the frame perimeter. So that was a big discussion that we had about, is that okay? Um, and at one point, it couldn't even do that, right? So our, our tra transit configuration wasn't going to be everything stowed flat. It was going to be with the arm in this, you know, midway upright position. Um, <clears throat> is it important to be able to hold a game piece inside the frame perimeter? Maybe not, you know? Um, what about starting with a game piece? You know, does the robot need to be able to start with a game piece or can we you know, position it somewhere on the ground and just pick it up as soon as we start, whatever, right? Those are important questions that help us define what is an acceptable versus unacceptable solution, right? So when somebody comes up with an idea of, hey, what if we did this? You can answer yes or no, it does or doesn't meet our requirements. And that's the purpose of this exercise. So we'll go back to airplanes for a second, a um, little bit of an industry tie-in, right? Um, we do requirements all the time. Um, for Boeing commercial airplanes, we have airplane requirements and objectives. Those are the high level airplane functional requirements. And then those get um, allocated and distributed out to each of the subsystems, which are, there are a lot of on an airplane, a lot more than on a robot. Um, <clears throat> but those get developed as detailed or system level functional requirements. Um, and then we link and trace them to each other, right? So. Um, Airplane level requirements need to have system level, at least one system level requirement that links to it um, so that we know that it's being supported. Um, I work with requirements all the time at my actual job. Um, and again, we're a little less formal in FRC, but it's still the same process. And it's still the same, uh, it's still the same objective that we're trying to achieve within the engineering process. So quick look back at that process and where we're at. We're still in step three here at the specify requirement stage. Um, for airplanes, those system requirements are coming from the regulations, from the airplane needs and from Boeing best practices. For robots, those requirements are coming from the robot and the game rules, our own team's best practices and the resources that we have available to us. So what makes a good requirement? Um, I prefer using the SMART system um, which stands for specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time bound. And we can look at how each of those impacts a requirement. So specific is talking about the scope of the requirement, right? And this is, instead of saying that the robot must be fast, what about the robot must be fast? Okay, the lifter, right? Whether it's an elevator arm, etc., the lifter must be fast. Measurable, we have to be able to determine if the thing that we built meets the requirement. Um, so how do we know it's fast enough? We'll put a time on it, right? Um, the lifter elevator must be able to do it in X number of seconds. Attainable. It needs to be physically possible. I mentioned before, we're not breaking physics here in, in robots. Um, don't require your lifter to move at the speed of light. Um, more practically, right? Don't require your lifter to move faster than the motors can actually, you know, physically make a system move on a FRC robot. Um, faster than the software can control it, et cetera. Um, and understanding what that actually is 
um, takes some understanding of both the FRC control system and, um, you know, the electrical system, the motors, et cetera. That goes back to understanding what our team's capabilities are. Um, relevant. The requirement is necessary to perform the strategy, right? The lifter must be pink, okay? Well, that's a specific, measurable, and attainable uh, requirement, but it's also not relevant to actually whether it executes our strategy or not. Um, it doesn't make it a bad requirement necessarily, but it's not, it, it doesn't link to our strategy. <clears throat> um, if you want to make a pink lifter, make a pink lifter. That's, I'm all good with that. Um, and then time bound. We actually don't touch this one that much in FRC, but it actually can be useful. Um, and this is the timeline for when the goal needs to be met by, right? So we could set a requirement that says, hey, the lifter must move full travel in three quarters of a second by Glacier Peak, which is our first event, right? Um, we don't usually state this for our design requirements. It's often more about our team goals or strategies, right? Um, number of cycles that we want to be able to achieve by championship, or we want to win the district championship in the next three years. Um, but it is part of developing SMART goals, and we can see later that, you know, you could actually split out goals by, um, or requirements, by different levels of competition or different weeks of competition, um, and say, all right, this kind of robot's going to be good enough for our early events, but by the time we, you know, if we qualify for championship, by the time we get there, um, it's not going to be able to compete at the level, so we need to be able to get to here. Um, and that comes back to evaluating the robot design that we're coming up with and whether it's going to be able to achieve the goal. We still live, Steve? Okay. So what does a well-written detailed requirement look like? So we're talking about a lifter. Um, let's say we need to lift 15 pounds. That's the estimated weight of the end effector um, and the game piece, piece, plus a little bit of you know buffer on there because we don't really know in the first couple days of the season exactly how much this is gonna weigh. Um, we need it to go bottom to top in three quarters of a second. Um, and the lifter itself is gonna get a weight allocation of 30 pounds. So. 30 pounds to build the lifter system, um, and it's got to be able to lift 15 pounds, right? So then our written out requirement is the lifter must weigh less than 30 pounds and be able to raise, raise 15 pounds full travel in 0.75 seconds, right? Um, we could go even further and specify what full travel is um, or link it to, you know, it needs to be able to stack, you know, go this high on the scale or whatever, right? Um, there should be somewhere where full travel is, is defined um, in context of what the functional requirements of the robot is. Most of the time, we'll just leave it in the bullet form rather than writing it out as a, as a fully written you know, sentence requirement, um, as long as it meets the SMART criteria. And this is where I'll say it's okay to break the rules sometimes, right? It's okay to specify, some, specify something like elevator instead of lifter here if that architecture decision has already been made. Now, I don't recommend making that architecture decision before you write your requirements, but you could. And if you do, you can write your requirement like that too. Um, we'll touch on this a little bit later, but breaking the rules is okay as long as you recognize that you're doing it um, <clears throat> and that you're taking a shortcut and you know what you're giving up by, uh, by making that shortcut. So <clears throat> some more examples here. Um, a launcher from um, Rapid React, right? So at this point, we'll say we don't know if we're building a wheeled shooter, a catapult, linear puncher, whatever. Um, we're writing general requirements for launching the ball. So we're going to score level in the upper hub. Um, we need a rate of fire of two cargo in two seconds. We need the accuracy to be 95%. Um, and the shot locations, we need to be able to shoot from the fender to the launch pad, right? So that's defining where on the field or basically the range requirement. And so then we write it all out, say the launcher must be able to score two cargo in two seconds in the upper hub with 95% accuracy from the fender to the launch pad. And that's something that when we start evaluating our prototypes um, or our overall robot concept, we can look at this and determine, are we working towards a solution that's going to be able to meet this requirement or not? So continuing down that path, we could split up this requirement, 
right? We could have different levels of accuracy or rate of fire um, for different levels of play. Maybe we only need 80% accuracy by week one because the level of play is lower. And we want to get to 95% by champs. So maybe we're okay with accepting a solution that we could only get 80% accurate um, on our uh, prototype because it's a rough prototype, but we're pretty confident that um, we can build that and figure out some tweaks to dial in. And so by the time we get to the end of the season, we'll be able to meet our 95% requirement rather than spending additional time in the prototyping phase, trying to refine this thing to the point where we say, all right, we got 95% um, and now we've burned through another week of build season that we could have been working on other stuff. Um, or maybe we want to increase our rate of fire um, by district champs. So we want to make sure that we're choosing a solution that isn't going to lock us into a you know maximum rate of fire that's slower than 1.5 seconds. Um, we're okay shooting you know maybe only out to the cargo ring week one, but by week three we have to be able to shoot from the launch pad or more combinations, right? We don't usually get this specific. But this is a valid way to write requirements. And if it helps your team think about the problem, then you should do it. Um, I do think that it's helpful to discuss what the robot needs to be able to do to be competitive at early season events versus later season events, um, just in terms of the context of when we're deciding on robot architectures, um, something that's, you know, the term scalable, right, um, is usually beneficial, um, especially in cycle-based games. So these are the detailed requirements from Jack and the Bot from 2023. I'm not going to go through all of them, <laughs> um, but I will pick out a couple of them um, to look at. Like we can look at our intake. Um, we have two requirements here at the bottom of the first intake column. Um, we say deployable and usable while in motion full speed. Okay? The intake that we designed had to be able to pick up game pieces um, we had to be able to deploy it and pick up game pieces while we're moving at full speed. And then the first one on the second column says deployable and usable while the robot is stopped, right? So we bracket our um, robot speeds there and basically say whatever we come up with for the intake, it's got to be able to work in this whole range. Um, you know, we wanted to be able to intake <clears throat> cones and cubes while they're next to the wall, Um we had a replaceability requirement on the intake that said it was easy to swap in less than eight minute turnaround. Um, and then we had a replaceability requirement at the bottom of the lifter that said it was replaceable in a specific time frame. Um, we never went back and, and actually made the change, but we ended up swapping those. The lifter and intake assembly, we could swap in less than eight minutes. The intake itself was so tightly integrated with the end of our arm, right, the lifter in this case, that, um, that we definitely couldn't do it in eight minutes. Um, so we achieved the same thing. Ultimately, we just changed the point at which that was being done. Um, but we did have those requirements written in here and we wrote it on the intake in the early days because that's the thing that's outside the robot and exposed that we expect to actually get damaged the most. Um, so you'll notice also that we specified lifter here at this point in the season, um, which is like day three or four that we're coming up with these detailed requirements. Um, we have not decided what robot we're building. We don't know if it's going to be an elevator or an arm um, or something else, I guess, some combination. <clears throat> okay, so where are we in the process? I just kind of mentioned first couple days, right? So you are here in somewhere between the first weekend and the first week. Um, we're still developing our requirements. We're starting to think about what the robot might actually look like. But all of this part of the process that we've just talked about, and all of the focus that we've put on it, is still just the first three to four days of the season. Because it's so important that you get this stuff figured out quickly before you actually get to designing. Um, because whatever we come up with on the design side we have to be able to evaluate whether it's going to meet our requirements or not. So we have to have those requirements. Um, so here's where I'll stop and uh, take some more questions, especially questions about requirements. Um, and then uh, after that, Steve's going to go on a bit of a deep dive on the autonomous mode. So do we have any questions? 
Okay, that's what I thought. What does your timeline for determining the robot architecture look like? When do you freeze levels of detail? Yeah, um, so we'll definitely talk a little bit more about this at the end of the presentation. Um, but the end of the first week is really when we lock down the concept of the robot that we're going to build. Um, so we've talked now through the first couple days, developing our requirements. At this point, we jump into prototyping and um, sketching in CAD or freehand or whatever and coming up with a bunch of different concepts and then trying to figure out which ones are going to meld together well enough to be um, a whole an overall robot design that checks all of the boxes on our requirements um, and that's at the end of the first week we kind of have a big a big meeting where we go this is what we're this is what we're going for um yep why do you make a no list and not just say anything that is not on the list yeah okay so the question was um why do we make a no list and not just say anything that's not on the list is a no um <clears throat> I mean, the, the intent kind of is that everything that's not specifically on the needs or wants is a no. Um, but the purpose there is really to call out things that are options in the game, well-defined options in the game, right? You can look at Charged Up and say, <clears throat> um, getting a game piece directly from the single substation is absolutely something a robot could do. Holding or moving multiple game pieces is absolutely something that um, a robot can do, right? The rules spell it out very clearly. And then we say, we are not designing a robot that's going to do that. Because when we start getting ideas down, it's really easy to go down these tangents of, <clears throat> oh, but we could, you know, just to do a little bit more and we'd get this capability or do a little bit more and get this capability. We really want to focus it in and say, no, we've decided that that's capability that doesn't help us achieve our goal. Um, so we're not going to entertain scope creep. Cool. All right. Steve time. So while detailed and very FRC specific, I find sometimes that this discussion of design requirements can get sort of academic and sort of abstract. So uh, an easy way to say, all right, the, the match is so long and there's so much stuff to do. How do you know what you need to do when is to look directly at autonomous mode. So the game pieces mostly aren't moving or the ones that you're starting to look at are placed on the field in a known position and your robot is placed on a field within a certain set of parameters in a known position you can't play defense for the most part in modern frc autonomous so you're not dealing with a dynamic situation until you introduce dynamics to it so you can what evan talked about with uh, robots that can pick up a game piece while the robot isn't moving, that's possible. If you can get to a place really quickly, then you can stop and grab something and then go back. Your different design requirements will allow you different solutions and vice versa. If you think that you can do this um, in a certain amount of time, then you might change your, your overall design requirements because you're capable of these things. Um, but autonomous is... Uh, usually 15 seconds nowadays sometimes 10 seconds so you have to be really clear about it because if you in teleop if something takes you 11 seconds instead of 10 seconds that's probably okay if it's not every single time in autonomous if you go over the time limit you will have not completed what you're doing so it's not okay <laughs> so you have, you have much stricter design requirements and that makes it easier that's the entire thing with design requirements is by putting walls around something, you make it easier to find a solution within those walls. Um, and it also helps in sort of strategic design when you're talking about our robots going to be able to do this because autonomous has separate point bonuses and point goals. And sometimes directly you can only get certain points for ranking points in that. So we have to do this now. So we have to be able to do this autonomously that really can help you define what 
your robot's going to have to do because you can't do it later in the match. So let's look at a couple of games specifically about this problem. So autonomous mode in 2018. The plates randomize when the match starts, so you've already placed your robot down, and it go, it's going to have to go to a place and do a thing. And this is one of the more dynamic autonomouses in this regard. But, all right, so your goal is to score a bunch of cubes in the scale, a perfectly reasonable goal that year. It was really impactful because you wanted to get the thing tilted toward you as early as possible. It's harder for your opponents to score on it, you start accumulating points, all these things. All right, what does that entail? Your robot has to get over there. You have to be able to drive. Then it has to deposit a cube. Then it has to pick up another cube. And because of the way that this game was structured, with the field like this, with cubes along the switch fences, which were next, which were on your side, you had up to these six cubes just sitting on the field available for you to use to get to your scale or your switch. But if you were focused on a scale auto, you could say, all right, well, first we're going to drive over. The scale's basically directly in front of us. We can drive in a straight line and deliver the cube. All right, well, if you're going to pick up the second cube, where you just drove to is, matters a lot because you only have the 15 seconds to do it in. So you're thinking, well, if I'm going to pick up the second cube, I want to be in the right position after I've scored my first cube. And so this led the, I think, three teams that year demonstrated a four-cube autonomous mode, 254, 842, and uh, 2471 mean machine. And all three of those robots picked up and delivered on opposite sides of their robot, had the capability of doing that, because spinning takes time even with a swerve drive it does take time relative to going in a straight line um, i don't think any of them were swerves but you start to see oh if we're really trying to push the limits on this our collecting and delivering being on the same side of our robot will limit us in this area so there you have a huge design requirement because there's a place right after you've scored your first cube where you can directly back up, pick up, directly go forward and score. And that's really enticing. It's, it's less strenuous to, to test, to get your tune exactly correct, to have your robot spin twice to do that. But that's true for the first cube that you pick up. The second cube is farther away. The third cube is farther away. So you have to think about each of these things as a discrete action with discrete actions within itself. So Again, three teams were able to do that. Other teams could get to three. Lots of, well, lots of very high level teams were able to get to three on their side. But even if your robot was very well designed to be able to do that, it was still difficult. So you have to look at another thing that you're looking at in different years. What is the entire challenge? 2022 was very different from 2018 in this regard. Your side of the field had the cargo that you started with and the cargo on the field and the cargo in your terminal that your human player could roll out to your robot. So when it came down to it, you had five cargo for the best auto, two cargo for the second best auto, and one cargo for the third best auto. But again, they're in all these different places. And we see it's strange. Well, it's not strange. But you will see why a lot of teams make the decision to fire from the opposite side that they pick up. Jack in the Bot in 2022 didn't do this for other system design requirements because they said, we said, yeah, it would be better if we just drove straight forward and could fire right from there. But the swerve drive works. So we can go there and spin and we can make more complex curves to get to these places and just keep spinning. That's an acceptable solution as long as we can hit these other time-based design requirements so that we get to these places and then start shooting the cargo as long as we get the five from the the far side of the hub and going over to the terminal and finding different places to score and if we can do that that with a collector that collects on the same side that we dispense from that fits within our design requirements 
We also saw some weird different orders of that. Some teams, 1577 world finalists, they didn't go for the first cargo that was directly in front of them first. They went over to the terminal, then came back for that one. What order you do it in might be, you might look at the robot that you're, or the design requirements, score these five cargo, but don't start locking into, all right, so first we pick up this one, and then we pick up this one, and then we pick up this one, and then we pick up this one. If you are doing your design requirements properly, you can work within your desire, design requirements and find out later in the season as you're developing the system. The other order works. The other order is better for us. If you over-define, you can lock yourself out of some solutions. And looking at the rolling out of the cargo and where they were placed and just the total distance that you have to travel in 2022, you could say, this is all doable within 15 seconds. As long as our robot can move X number of feet per second on average, that's really important. That really drives design requirements. Robots are a lot faster now with brushless motors, but driving half the field one and a half times with some specific points in the middle there, the time it takes you to traverse is not zero. And so getting those those concepts locked in as you, as you talk about your design requirements, it's going to take us this number of seconds to do this. Some of those things you're really not going to be able to change. Last year, 2023 with 2910, we actually did change that by going past L3 gearing throughout the season. But that was because we had basically exhausted our other places to speed things up. And that's speeding up your drivetrain is not usually the solution that you go for when you're trying to speed up your entire cycle time. It's more on pickup and delivery. But it depends on the game and it, it depends on what things are going to be really important for your robot. 2016 Stronghold was a very different auto mode, especially compared to 2022. So similar size balls, similar size game pieces, but they acted sort of differently. And you could only hold one at a time. And we were working with uh, less sophisticated controls and motors back then. So it was harder to get the sort of precision that you needed. But a big goal for teams that were working at a really high level was score more than one boulder. You start with one boulder, you have to cross over the defenses and shoot it from the courtyard. But there is a line of cargo of, sorry, boulders that start on this center line which you can't cross. You can't even go in the plane that is the auto line, but there are there is some subset of the boulder that is on your side of the field. So your collector has to be able to pick up a ball without getting past its midpoint. And when you're thinking about, you have to cross this defense, fire, come back, pick up a ball, cross the defense again and fire. Most of the teams that were able to do the two boulder auto actually found that it was more repeatable because you've driven over a defense, which was a, a ramp up, a little flat piece and a ramp down, and then over again to get back to that boulder. Their odometry wasn't, was imperfect. They're, you're working on different surfaces. So it's actually more accurate for them to drop the first boulder that they started with onto the floor into a known location that wasn't where the auto line was and immediately go drive over and pick it up off the auto line because that's when they had the best precision in terms of where their robot was placed. So they wouldn't have to cross that line to do it. And that was the point that was the point in auto before they'd driven over and back when they were most repeatedly able to get to a certain point. Then after they'd gone and shot and come back, if they missed the exact placement of the boulder that they had dropped by a couple of inches, it wouldn't be an immediate penalty for going into your opponent's side of the field during autonomous. Um, so as you drive across things and, and just the field in general, you're 
you're going to lose precision as autonomous goes on, even if you're really good at it. You just are more accurate with the first things that you're doing. So if you can simplify the challenge, the hardest part of the challenge, if you can do that the first at the beginning of auto, that's better. And that's something the teams were able to do in Stronghold. Now that was true for the teams that could all go under the low bar and uh, they had a killer autonomous mode. It didn't, it was repeatable because it was very straightforward defense to get across. But there are three robots out there and there was actually an alliance a championship that had two robots that could do the two boulder auto. So one of them had to not do that. So whichever one, 987, high rollers, they were better at the going over the predetermined by your opponent's defenses in the middle than 195 was with its two boulder auto. So these combinations and compatibility matter. Um, if there are only so many autonomous tasks to complete, you have to be able to do more than one. Um, otherwise, you're putting your alliance into a position where your other robots are doing something that they're not super great at. And that was really kind of important in 2017, um, Steamworks. So everybody could start with a gear and there were the hoppers on the side of the field and there was the one that was like right next to the, the high boiler, the high boiler that everybody would go trigger and then sit under and shoot the 50 uh, fuel that came out of it into the high boiler from. That's where everybody went that had like a high capacity robot. But if you scored one gear, if you delivered one gear to the peg and the human player brought it up and put it into the center column, that was worth one rotor. To get to the second rotor, which you, it wasn't based on gears, it was based on a number of gears for each rotor and that increased as the match went on. Or as, as more gears got scored, you needed more gears to get to the next one. So autonomous modes that year lots and lots and lots and almost every single alliance got one rotor in auto one robot was able to score one gear but if you could score all three if you could put them on pegs and have the two human players who were in there bring up all three gears so that was a complication and put them in it's a it was like a huge bonus in auto but you're fighting against you're also trying to get the KPA, the, the kilopascals of pressure, the, the fuel into the boiler thing. And there's only so much time to do any of these things. So there were very few teams that were able to both deliver a gear and trigger the hopper and fire all 60 balls, the 10 that they started with and the 10 and the 50 in that side of the hopper in auto. So some teams looked at this and said, well, if we have a great fuel shooting robot on our alliance, we don't want them wasting time or not being able to shoot fuel if they have to put this gear up for us to get the three gear auto that we want. So we'll have to be able, we will have to be able to pick up another gear in auto. And that's a really complicated thing. But thinking through what your total alliance is capable of is as valuable as looking at what one robot is practically able to do during autonomous. And you would find these things, there's some value, there was some value in Steamworks to getting two gears into the airship in auto. You couldn't score the second rotor during autonomous mode. And so that bonus was forever lost to you, the extra bonus that you got during autonomous for getting the second rotor. But you still need that gear for later. So if you can get two gears, that's better than getting one. It's just nowhere near as good as getting three. And thinking about that applies in other years. Sure, you can't score all of these pieces, but if you pick them up, you should be able to score them during the rest of the match. Most years, the thing that you're scoring in auto isn't only allowed to be scored in auto, 2007 notwithstanding. Ridiculous. They went out there with knives and like cut the, t the, the tubes, the keepers out of robots so that they wouldn't be scored during teleop. It was so weird and they just jumped up. All of these things that you can't do anymore for obvious safety reasons. That was just part of the game back then. But this was also a case of 
if you're looking at the different things that you can get most of the way to, getting most of the way to scoring three gears, quite valuable. Getting most of the way to shooting fuel, not nearly as valuable. If you could trigger the hopper, but you couldn't fire an auto, you might as well not trigger the hopper in auto. That doesn't get you anything. The only the only value in triggering a hopper in auto was the set, was to be, let you score fuel in auto when it was worth three times as much. So the autonomous mode is really helpful because there are there are always bonus there are probably always bonuses associated with them. And when you're looking at the game in strategic design, the 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 things that Evan linked to earlier in the other presentations. You don't, you can't do certain things later in the match. You can't score some auto points because you, they can only be scored in auto. You can't score your second gear 20 seconds left in the match and then score the other 15 gears after that in 2017, for example. So your opportunities go away as you run out of time. Some things take a long time and you have to start them as early as possible. And that's where auto can really help kind of crystallize. Like what is your robot going to have to do during this entire game? Because if you're trying to think of, all right, we need to be able to cycle a certain number of times over the course of the game in 2023, we need to be able to do about 10 tally up cycles. Figuring out how to make your robot fast enough to do 10 instead of 9 is very difficult. But looking at it and saying, in autonomous mode, we have to score three pieces. We have 15 seconds. We can break each of these things down. This takes two seconds. This takes one second. That, that you can really define easily. But the entire match, that can be difficult to do with that level of precision. You just, too many vagaries and, and unknowns. Do we have any auto-based questions before we go back to Evan? Yeah. Um, question on do you develop for multiple versions of auto? Yes. So do you do you develop more than one version of an autonomous mode? Ideally, yes. But at at both extremes of autonomous acumen, you kind of don't necessarily have to. So um, what ended up being the meta in 2023? just to think about charged up just for a second um almost every alliance needed wanted a robot that could score the game piece that they started with go over the charge station get into the zone past which they would earn the mobility points and then get back on the charge station and balance for the the maximum score that a robot that wasn't picking up additional game pieces could score so that's the like third partner sort of thing and even if you have great alliance partners, for most of this year, they still wanted a team that could do that. Or if you have an autonomous mode that is so good, like 971s this year, from the smooth side of the charge station, they could score three game pieces. So deliver, pick up, score, pick up, score, and balance on the charge station by themselves. And so that says, that's the what other auto mode would we possibly need that's like the maximum practical thing that we can be using we can use that every single match so there's a lot of space in between those ex, those two extremes um if you have the development time it's useful to look at what is the majority what the teams that we're going to be playing with in these matches what auto modes do they have if you have more autonomous capability you should look at the field and say what's missing if you can fill that role you'll be more valuable it'll be easier to have everybody on your alliance playing to their top capability there is a trade-off and i mentioned that in one of these slides the more auto modes you develop the more auto modes you have to tune and it's just a time sink so some some years are very different um 2023 most top level teams probably had to have at least two really killer auto modes 
you had to have the bump side and you have to and you had to have the smooth side because you didn't know who you were paired you were paired with in 2022 rapid react if you had the five that was super super accurate you were good you really you, the capability of doing that compared to the capability of doing the two cargo auto or the one cargo auto because of how the cargo was actually set up that year if you had the five you also had those other ones you pretty much didn't even have to tune those you would just have your auto mode stop after a certain point copy paste that's a new auto mode um some years it's more it's a lot more complicated than that but um yeah a big dichotomy between rapid react and um, charged up in terms of what it would take to tune more than one autonomous mode. Um, so the next question is, do we have a methodology on when to design the robot around an autonomous pool versus Teleot pools? For example, in 2022, we prioritized the traversal um, over engaging and shooting from opposite sides. Yeah, so the question is, when do you make autonomous modes a higher or lower priority within your design goals for your team and boy that's a, that's a really 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 intensely hard question to answer um sort of trying to like look at it from one level above what are you, what are you doing for just that season you might think of it as if you have more cons in more confidence in your driving and teleop control and mechanical capabilities you might prioritize autonomous more because in prioritizing autonomous you are trying to make that easier for you and vice versa if you have ultimate confidence that whatever auto mode you end up running it's gonna work you have the time you have a full practice field that you're able to work with your programming team is exceptionally good um you have a really firm grasp on pathing and sensors and everything else. You say, so I will use, I will use two examples of this. Um, if you look at our 2910's tech binder and CAD release, and then you look at 254 Cheesy Poops tech binder and CAD release, you can see that we, uh, we have a great programming team, don't get me wrong, but a lot of the new mentors had come from situations where they not had that. So we do, we, Evan and I especially, tend to think of it in terms of how can we make auto mode easier? What, do, what can the system do to make it more straightforward to control? So our robot, we did say very early on, we wanted to be able to pick up and score on opposite sides because even with a good programming team, they also agreed that spinning makes everything harder. 254, their first priority was actually teleop cycles, was getting to the um, getting to the double substation with a very repeatable, very fast pickup. And they said, this, this leads us to this design with an elevator in the back. And our auto modes, we have the, the utmost confidence in them. And then uh, Andrew Torrens in one of his posts about it says, and our auto modes were really hard to tune. Like, because we had to pick up and score on the same side, it made getting those paths absolutely correct and fast enough very difficult. And they, we were both able to do all of these things that we wanted to do, but um, it does come down a little bit to your own self-confidence in each of your systems. And some of it is if you really, if it's, if you're struggling with the abstract of how do we solve this big problem that takes place over a long period of time, then you should try to, it's worthwhile to solve the problems that you can actually already sort of see solutions to. Because if you're a week in and you've got a lot of magic occurs here, that leads to sad times. That leads to um, you, the magic doesn't come in later or it does very much later and you haven't tested and run your robot doing anything in auto and or in teleop it comes down in modern frc it is very much how long have you actually driven your robot on a practice field or on the real field with everything together so 
You can't be lost in conceptual space for too long. Evan's back. I'm actually going to segue in. I have a slightly different answer than Steve to that question. Um, I think for one, uh, the requirements are the requirements, right? And so any robot architecture that you develop needs to be able to um, meet those requirements. And some years, um, it's easier to meet those requirements in autonomous mode compared to, um, you know, some of the teleop goals. In some years, it's it's more difficult. Um, or there are specific things that, like, we know that nailing autonomous is really, really important. So, for example, um, in 2022, uh, if you go back to, to the first present pop-up presentation that Steve did on um, game history, uh, the autonomous mode for the, the best autonomous mode of the five ball pickup um, was fairly easy for high caliber teams in terms of the timing requirements. Um, it was a widely achievable mark. Um, and so that means that the requirements that that puts on the robot architecture are relatively minimal. Um, whereas the climbing challenge maybe was was a bigger driver, right? We look at the challenge and we go, yeah, we can still do the five ball auto even if we have to turn around to pick up the first ball. Um, contrast that with 2023 and we look at the game and there's a point maximum that seems actually achievable. Um, and part of being able to achieve that point maximum means that you have to be able to score all of the out of the alliance all of the game pieces in auto that is a requirement if you miss those there is absolutely no way to make that up and so that leads to we must be able to do the three game pieces in auto that is a the hard hard requirement and um in order to do that with the amount of driving and precision and placement that's required right in 2022 you could pick up the ball and shoot from there long range can't do that in 2023. You got to drive all the way back, right? So there is a more of a focus on um, minimizing the amount of driving that's required because that's going to enable precision and reduce the amount of speed that the robot actually needs to travel through the path, right? So those are the things that we're considering in our game analysis that's leading into the requirements development. And then ultimately, it's about coming up with a robot concept that meets our requirements. And if we, um, you remember back to um, the Jack and the Bot 2023 high level requirements, our, our needs and wants list, our need was five second auto cycles. And so we were looking at architectures that were going to, going to give us confidence that we could actually hit that, um, that target. So um, it's about coming up with a design that meets all of the requirements. The end goal of all of this, the requirements, the um, autonomous analysis, all of that is a complete set of requirements that fully describes our intended strategy, robot functions, and design objectives, right? It's allowing us to determine which mechanisms and our prototypes meet our goals. It allows us to decide which robot concept is the best at achieving our goals, especially when we have multiple concepts that maybe all meet them in some way. Um, it allows us to evaluate if we've designed a robot that can play the game the way that we want to, including autonomous mode, and allows us to have a common baseline for discussing adjustments and changes to our design, to our strategy, um, or even to our team goals. Um, again, I'm not going to open up these links, but these are some links to um, requirements that other teams developed um, in recent years, done slightly differently, but all equally valid. Not every team does requirements the same way. And I would say most teams aren't perfect. I certainly, you can go back and look at the Jack in the Bot requirements and, you know, at the end of the season, there's stuff there that like, well, we really shouldn't have said it this way and we should have had this requirement that we kind of talked about but didn't actually write down and blah, 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 blah. Like we weren't perfect about it, but it still helps us in the process. Right? The purpose is to get the team thinking about the problem in the same way. Getting the requirements done early in the first few days, changing them later if necessary, but establishing a common baseline, and defining what questions we need to answer 
from our prototypes, from our Crayola CAD, from our layouts, etc. I mentioned this earlier. In FRC, we sometimes skip steps in the design process. We have a very short time frame that we're working in. And that's okay to do as long as we're recognizing which steps we're skipping and why. Whether it's background research, whether it's um, some of the requirements, uh, specificity, et cetera, um, right? If we understand what we should be doing, then we can talk about deviating from that and we all understand what the potential risks of doing that are. We agree that that's an okay risk because it's worth it to move the process forward a little bit quicker. So a little bit of a timeline check coming back to what does this look like for 2910. So our rough week one schedule on day one kickoff day, we're doing our strategic analysis. We end the day with a draft of our priority list, our needs, wants, knows. Um, day two, we call Sunday fun day. This is where we go do match and autonomous simulations and validate our priority list. So we've talked previously about how we get robots together with local teams um, and try and find a full field size space that we can mark out, mock up, and actually try to simulate what match flow is actually going to look like, right? So we have a concept from day one from our analysis of how this game plays out and what things are important. Day two, we're trying to do as much as we can to validate that priority list um, and make changes if we need to. Um, not everybody's involved in this. Some team members are usually you know, at home creating basic reference geometry um, of the field to get an idea of the sizing problem, You know, understand what the design problem that we're looking at because everything fits in your head and then you put it in the scale model in CAD and it doesn't fit so good. Um, day three, Monday. This is when um, we're usually doing our detailed system requirements. Um, there's also some starting on basic robot concepts and hand sketches and CAD and stuff. But really, day three, we're trying to talk through what are, do the systems on the robot need to be and what do they need to do. Um, and then days four through seven, we're not meeting every single day in person. But usually, people are working on stuff every day on their own at least. Um, we're creating concepts, we're making prototypes based on the requirements, right? So one of the big things that comes out from our detailed requirements is a list of stuff that we don't know the answer to um, in terms of what designs will be able to do this or is something even physically possible, et cetera. Um, so we're trying to answer those questions. And then day eight, the second Saturday, one week from kickoff, that's when we decide on our robot concept. So we're going to confirm that all of our requirements are still correct based on what we learned over the week. Um, we actually st sit down and review all of those and go, yep, that's still correct. Or actually, we think that, you know, this requirement was, um, you know, too conservative and we need to um, be, a, you know, a lot more. We need this to be a lot faster. Like, this is super easy to do at the speed that we defined, so everybody's going to be able to do it that quickly. Um, or maybe it's a lot harder than we thought it was going to be. Um, or there's been rule updates and a strategy that we thought was going to be feasible is actually just not legal anymore. Um, all right, there's rule updates affecting the plan strategy. Um, on this, and, and, and you know, in this year in particular, there were a lot of questions um, in the early days about what was and wasn't allowed in terms of interacting with the charge station for balancing, for lifting up robots, et cetera. Um, so those got answered pretty quickly on, but the, um, the Q&A doesn't open until Wednesday after kickoff, right? So we're sometimes going to be sitting on the, well, we're pretty sure this is how this is going to get answered, but we're not going to have a, a real answer until later in the week. Um, do our prototype results tell us anything? Um, that's a really important one. Uh, we, and I'll go into that a little bit later, but we learned some really critical things from our prototypes this season that drastically changed the direction that our intake um, was taking in design. Um, and then what robot concept meets the requirements the best. So usually we've got a couple different concepts floating around at this point, um, or we've got one concept we like, but we're trying to refine it down to something that actually meets all the requirements. Um, and then end of day eight, we start the real primary geometry. So the actual document that's going to be the final robot. Um, so in a little bit more detail, um, kickoff day, after the meeting, after we've got our, our priority list, 
Um, we'll either look at or review some basic field geometry CAD to get a grasp on the size of the problem. Um, the picture here is actually from Wild Stang's blog, um, build blog this year. But um, we, you know, we looked at this and then we also made our own version so we could play around with it. But this was kind of looking at the different scoring levels, um, et cetera, with a 26 six inch long robot on the floor. And you look at this and you immediately go, oh, that is a long reach. Um, you know, and that's maybe not immediately obvious when you're just looking at the images in the in the game manual. Um, like, we're going to need something big sticking way out there in order to be able to do this. Um, days two through seven. Throw ideas in CAD and see what sticks. So here's a bunch of different really basic mock-ups, all based off of that same field geometry um, that we created. Right, we had a very basic pink arm um, that wasn't what we ended up with, um, you know, but it's similar. This is just a more standard one with a central pivot that's a little bit higher up. We had a tilted elevator with a linear extension um, that was just, you know, I mean, these are like five, 10 minute sort of CAD sketches just to try and understand the geometry problem. Um, tilted elevator, but with a rotational joint, um, like a wrist. Um, a linkage arm based on 67 hot teams, 2005. Um, and I've just put two pictures there kind of showing the two different motions. Um, and we're looking at all these and going, what's going to, what's going to work the best. You'll notice of, of these three or, or four concepts, um, the, the pink arm is one that really lets us be able to pick up and score on opposite sides of the robot. Um, tilted elevator with the wrist also could do that, but it would require being able to pass the um, the wrist through the elevator structure. So um, those are the considerations. Right. Hopefully we're back now. Um, yeah. So talking about refining refining some of our concepts in the early days, um, towards the end of the first week, um, we took the pink arm uh, concept and because it seemed like it was going to meet our requirements the best. Um, and try to see if we could package it a little bit lower, right? And so naturally we're looking at moving the pivot point to the back of the robot um, and then down lower because that gets uh, the arm, you know, closer to the uh, scoring side, uh, maybe reduces the length of the extension that we need, uh, et cetera, as well as, you know, being able to store it in a flat configuration. Um, and, uh, and starting some beginning looks at what uh, sort of a fork um, type mechanism that deploys off of the arm to a hard stop. And then um, when the arm retracts, it lifts the base up on what that would look like. So day eight um, is where we're really discussing uh, picking a concept, starting our real primary geometry. Generally coming into day eight, we've got a pretty decent idea of what, um, what we're going to be building. Right. So we're making a lot of final decisions here, um, but through the process of developing those um, earlier concepts and it usually becomes fairly apparent what is going to be meet our requirements the best. Um, but what is, you know, what are the some of the critical things that happened on day eight? Um, so this year we made a decision to add the wrist. Um, to the intake. So you'll notice uh, on the previous slide, um, there's no real wrist anything here. It's just a cone at the end of an arm. Um, we talked for a while about whether or not we wanted to add that degree of freedom. Um, and ultimately what we came up with, um, and you can see on the, uh, the left side of the screen, we've got the Kung Fu action wrist pros and cons. Um, Kung Fu action being this direction. Um, Right, but uh, it allowed us to score uh, in auto by going over over the back more easily. Um, it provided versatility on what intake design we ended up with. Right, we didn't need to have something that had a very specific geometry because there was no adjustability. Um, we had anti kabonk technology, so that was when coming into the loading station. Um, it allowed us to put the arm in a much more vertical configuration um, for grabbing the cones off the shelf so we could slam the bumpers into the wall. Um, without, you know, thwacking the arm every single time. 
Um, and then the cons was it was going to add mass to the end of the arm, and it was another degree of freedom. Um, ultimately, we decided that because we still had a lot of um, uh, questions about uh, how exactly the intake was going to be designed or even what the configuration was going to be, um, that we were much better off just deciding then very early on that we were going to add the wrist in um, and leave the door open to a lot more intake architectures um, rather than trying to force our way with a zero wrist um, design and potentially end up having to add it later, which would be even more work. Um, other big decisions that got made on um, Saturday, uh, at the Saturday one week from kickoff, um, and this is happening as we're sort of laying this out on the screen. Um, the uh, We're going to do a single sprocket with number 35 chain. Um, we were going to do pink style e-chain run. We, we thought at the time it was going to be on the side of the arm. We ended up moving it and tucking it under the motors later, right? So these aren't final decisions, but these are our best guess at what we're going to end up with, um, or at least our initial cut at how we think we're going to solve some of these really critical problems that come with the design. If you're going to design a pink arm with an, you know, telescoping extension, you have to think about how you're doing your wire management. It's just not an option to leave that as a thought exercise for later. You know, Steve mentioned magic occurs here, right? That's like, that's just a recipe for disaster. Um, we made decisions that the arm extension gearbox was going to be integrated with the side plates that were um, mounting the pivot. Um, that the pivot gearbox that, you know, drove drove that shoulder was going to be low and as far forward in the chassis as we could put it um, for center of gravity purposes. Um, that we were going to power the extension in both directions as opposed to having like spring extend winch retract. Um, we expected the arm tube sizes were going to be three, two and a half and two, which is what we ended up with. And that was based on doing some earlier layouts um, when it seemed like a pink arm was going to be the direction we were going a few days before. Um, you know, just, uh, it was, you know, just one of our mentors basically went in and was like curious if we could squeeze it into that package or if a three, two and one, which is more traditional was where we were going to end up. And we decided three, two and a half and two seemed like it was doable. So that's what we went with. Um, we decided on the wrist and then we had this TBD, um, which was the triple balance device, um, that we decided at that point in time, we didn't know if it was going on the robot or what it was going to be. But um, we were going to pursue it, and uh, it was going to have shared pivot and shared power with the arm. Um, and then yeah, ultimately, a few weeks later, we decided that we were not going to continue um, designing that into the robot. Um, so then that's the end of our first week, right? So our later weeks were refining, so we're doing higher fidelity prototyping, maybe testing real geometry out of CAD. Um, for example, our learning in week one um, with our prototypes uh, was that the sideways wheels were bad. Um, in this case, uh, you could see this this first video. Um, if we didn't absolutely hit the cube exactly dead on, it was just getting kicked away. Um, so this is a very rudimentary prototype. It's got some wheels on some drills um, on uh, mounted to a furniture dolly, right? So we're rolling the the prototype towards the game piece mimicking what the actual robot will do um and early tests where we hit it dead on looked very promising and this is the architecture that we thought we were going to have um for the robot um and and then ultimately uh we got to here and we said well that's not going to work like there's no way that we can expect our driver is going to be able to or our autonomous mode is going to be able to be so precise that we always hit both wheels on the cube at the same time. Um, so we ended up going with a horizontal roller um, prototype next. Um, and you can see that in the second video. Um, this was sort of testing, on the, this time on the cone. We'd already tested it on the cube and knew it was going to work well. Um, but convincing ourselves that we were going to be able to pick up upright cones, um, you know, the way that our requirement said. And uh, that test, um, I'll play it again. Um, pretty well convinced us that uh, that we were going to be able to meet our requirements with a, a horizontal roller system. Yeah, it's got vectored intake wheels on it because we were trying to figure out if we could like make it center the cone or something, and um, ultimately we decided it wasn't it didn't work good enough to be worth the wait. Um, 
week two, we're finishing primary geometry. So we're trying to get it to a point where um, it's never final until the robot cat is done. There's always some tweak that's being made um, to some interface or, or whatever. But um, overall robot size is locked down where major systems are interfacing is is defined um in this case it was where is the pivot how big is the sprocket um what's the extension length um on the arm gonna be we had we did not have an intake figured out at the end of week two um but we had some concepts um but but the the over the main like section of the robot was not fundamentally going to change um, and starting our, our 3D design um, starts in week two. Um, and then weeks three and four, we're finalizing our detailed design. We're ordering parts and we release parts for manufacturing, um, make it in-house, send it off to sponsors, et cetera, and then we build the robot. And all the you know magic happens and then bada bing, bada boom, go play. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the, the wrap up here. That's what our first week of the season you know, plus a little discussion on what happens after that looks like um, and the priority that we put on making sure that we get our strategic analysis correct um, and that we get our requirements correct so that as we're going through those exercises um, in that first week leading up to um, that second Saturday, um, we're, we're confident that um, if we if we come up with a design that meets the requirements, we're going to um, be able to achieve our goals, or at least design a robot that is capable of achieving our goals. Uh, yeah, so other questions? Yeah. I thought I put it on this slide. Okay. Um, we're, Evan's going to troll through the questions a little bit, um, pick some out, but this is kind of orthogonal to this presentation, but I usually don't speak as a representative of Swerve Drive Specialties, my employer, but I am right now. Grease your modules. <laughs> After you have put them together, but before you run them, put some grease on there. Red tacky, the stuff you get from Andy Mark, white lithium grease somewhere, you know, grease with like an NLGI of one, like relatively viscous stuff. We have enough power in the motors that that's not a problem. Don't use like motor oil, it'll just drip everywhere. Yeah, you have to grease them. You will get premature wear on your gears. They're spur gears and bevel gears. You potentially could get galling. They could actually stop moving if, if there's enough localized friction. And they're just, it's so loud. It's grease your gears i mean we only re-greased two or three times during the season even with now how many times okay so for our four events prior to championships and then championships so that's with many hours of practice time on them in addition so yeah you'll get carpet fuzz in there but this is entirely separate to this but please because more than one person has has asked me at competitions, oh, we should grease that? Yes. <laughs> yes, you should. Got any questions, Evan? Um. Do you want a regular question or an auto question? Sure. <laughs> um. Hi, Myla. Let's see. Uh, if we have two opposing sides on a topic, um, sort of a robot design concept or requirement, um, how do we decide whether or not we're going to that feature or you know, which way to go? So if you have more than one designer that has, that has come to a different conclusion about how you're going to solve a problem, how do you come to a resolution on your team about which one you're going to pursue? This comes down to, there are a couple of factors that are really important. How early in the season is this? How impactful to your design is it going to be overall? And who are your, who are your stakeholders in this? Who is going to have to execute the differences? Who is it going to matter for? So ideally, or not necessarily ideally, but 
your team structure should be such that there is a chief engineer, somebody whose role on the team is to when there is discussion about which way we should go. Somebody looks at all the information that everybody has, there's a big discussion, and then somebody makes a choice. Especially when it comes to detailed design requirements or, or solutions to detailed design requirements. Um, it can be difficult to get the entire team together and all on the same page. So you should have somebody with the authority to make those decisions. Um, stepping back a little bit, if you're doing early season stuff, early design requirements and things like that, um, don't vote. That's, that's my hard line. Never vote. Voting doesn't work within the design process. It's not good for anybody. Um, you will, with voting, end up with, well, I voted against this later in the season when it turns out, well, or didn't. Um, you, it really, it doesn't work. Um, if you're in a large enough group that you, when you're discussing whatever your decision's going to be, consensus is a nice way to do it, which is you, everybody presents sort of their feelings on the subject, um, evidence that you have from prototypes or sketches or um, knowledge of the situation or just intuition. Whatever you have, you discuss everything. And then when you are deciding between a couple of things, consensus is we are all in agreement that we are not going down the wrong path. It's not, we all think that this is the best option. We're going with that. That's I don't know, impossible to get to on a lot of these decisions, but you should be getting to the point where you're saying, where everybody is able to say, I think that this will work. I think that this is something that we should pursue. This is something that isn't going to lead to ruin. That's sort of consensus. But in, in smaller detail design things, somebody's somebody or some subset of people has to be able to have the authority to say we've seen the options we're picking this one otherwise you're not gonna you're just gonna be spinning your wheels i think evan's gonna take a question yeah sort of an awkward transition i picked a question and then i'm gonna answer it all right um you can't just give me a guys we'll do <laughs> so the, the question is um uh how how and how often do we validate our requirements do we just try and get stuff tested as quickly as possible um yes and no um when we develop our requirements at the beginning right we're developing them very early um the first validation is that day uh day after kickoff where we're trying to validate that our um strategic priorities are correct by whatever simulation methods available to us um, for the detailed requirements, um, and I should be clear here that um, in the requirements world, there's validation and there's verification. Validation is, do you have the correct requirement? And then verification is, does your thing meet the requirement? Um, so we try and validate our requirements just by basically discussion um, when we write them, right, in those first couple days is... Uh, some of that's based on experience um, from the more senior students, from the mentors, et cetera. Um, you know, is, the, is this a reasonable requirement to have? Some of it's just self-evident um, that, that it, the requirement is a, a valid requirement to have. And then as we're going through the process, there's checkpoints where we're trying to ensure that the design that we're developing um, is on track to meet those requirements. Ultimately, we're not going to be able to say for certain until we build the robot and run the robot um, and conclude that, yeah, yay, verily, it does meet the requirements. But um, we're doing a check uh, the Saturday after kickoff um, when we're coming up with our, we're picking our final concept and choosing um, our primary geometry, right? There's a, you know, basically a just a, a fairly quick discussion on is this, you know, let's run through the requirements. Is the thing that we're heading towards going, you know, to be able to meet all the requirements. Um, then there's a check, you know, a few weeks later when we're nearly done or done with our detailed design of the, um, of the robot that um, before we actually ship it off to make parts, 
is our design going to meet the requirements that we've set out? Um, that's based on prototyping results. That's based on um, whatever you know analysis, motor analysis, um, motor selection math, et cetera, that we've done um, to s determine that we've designed the system strong enough um, and fast enough, et cetera. <clears throat> and uh, and then once we build the robot and we start doing bring up and testing, then you know we we check it one more time. Um, so we do try and make sure that we have these planned in sort of checkpoints where we're looking back at the requirements that we've written and we're looking at the design as much as it's defined at that time and you know we can't say that we've met the requirements but we can say that we don't see any reason why this design won't meet the requirements and we continue down that path or we stop and say there's a clash here um, at which point we have to decide are we changing our requirement um, because we don't think it's valid anymore um, or are we going to change our design because um, you know, we need it to meet this requirement? Um, so, yeah. So, uh, what sort of tests do you do with that? Oh, yeah, that's a good one. Um, my baseline is that... Uh, you we try and prototype anything that we can't math right so something like um how quickly an arm is going to move or extend um or how much force it's going to be able to lift uh those kinds of things we're not going to prototype that that's something that we can easily figure out e with geometry and um you know calculators um how are wheels going to react against game piece what's the correct compression um, that kind of stuff, those are the things that we really want to make sure that we're testing in a physical sense. Um, even if it's something that's as basic as the videos that, that we had earlier where it's like just two wheels and drills, right? In that case, it's maybe not even so much about the correct compression as it is like, let's try this configuration in a couple different scenarios and see what's good and what's not. And then as we're you know, have picked a direction, we'll maybe try and refine it a little bit more. Um, so we did more, um, I don't have, I don't have videos of it, um, but, but we did more tests of this um, horizontal roller setup um, that had all three rollers and had the specific geometry that we were actually um, laying out in CAD to basically validate that the compression that we were having, the spacing between the wheels, et cetera, um, was was going to be correct, um, was going to function the way we want. Well, and, and there's something uh, sort of fundamental to prototyping and sort of the first week of design requirements that's, I think, difficult to really express and, and think about. Um, there, there are the physical prototypes, you're putting together a little system with a facsimile gearbox and, and some wheels or something, or a linkage to move something. That's one way of prototyping. Another way of prototyping is in CAD and or in programming, it's running something on a test bed. And depending on the problem that you're looking at, depending on the year, sometimes you can't get into your all of your detailed requirements until you've done at least some prototyping. Like you can't say we're going to have a, a design requirement that's going to have us scoring on all four levels of whatever this is that holds onto the game piece until it's re until you're over the scoring element if you then realize when just by catting it out that hey the extension rules don't allow you to do that this is a hypothetical i, I don't actually know in a, a game where this would be the case but you do have to work a little bit with the pro the the earliest prototypes that you can get to say what is a reasonable design requirement. Our design requirement is that we're going to shoot full field for 2012, 2013, 2020. It would be useful to prototype either via calculator or physical prototype if you can possibly get it before you lock into a design. Um, 
is this something that we think we can iterate on and make an acceptable version of? Is this a design requirement that we want to have? Or is this something that we don't think we'll be able to achieve no matter how vital we say it is? So um, there's, a, there's a little bit of back and forth there. I saw a question in the chat. Did we ever consider using a belt for the pivot, for driving the pivot on the 2023 robot? And no, not really. Um, we were pretty locked into mega uber stiffness on it and chain is stiffer than belt. And we didn't see a scenario where the weight difference or any other difference was enough to overcome the this fundamental aspect of of the different power transfer. Like you yeah. you can't replace that. So you at a certain point you have to make a decision. So it's the same thing with when when I talked about auto and the amount of time that you have and time that goes away. There are certain physical aspects that you can't replace um, as, as much as you'd want to. Um, if you have a robot structure that exists above a certain height, your center of gravity can only get so low. Y each of these things, if you have to have a sense for what is acceptable to trade off. And the, back to Evan talking about physics, some things you can't replace. You can't put any part of your robot below the carpet. So your center of gravity can only get so low because they disallow ground effects unjustly and unfairly ever since 2009. It was going to be sick. We were going to have skirts. <laughs> Instead, we had propellers. Just, it was totally different. Oh, I want ground effects. Okay. Um, yeah, I guess to add on to that one, um... My it's better if you're over here. Uh, yeah. To to add on to that one about the 2009 ground effects. No, we, were gonna, <laughs> we had we had it all planned out about the belts on the arm. Um, uh, some of that comes back to internal team best practices. Um, and what I mentioned before about having a good understanding of um mechanical factors that contribute to controllability. Right. Having watched and understood the 971 presentation on design for mechanical uh, mechanical design for controllability, <clears throat> the um, it's very clear that 35 chain is the best and the bigger sprocket that you can put on it, the better. Right. So that's our starting point, especially because our pivot's so low. We know that we're not going to really be taking a big, you know, center of gravity or, or weight hit by um by making it 35 chain so just make that decision and move on um i think i highlighted the question that i wanted how would, how would, you, how would you prevent choosing a fundamentally incompatible robot concept For example two mechanisms that are incredibly difficult to design. yeah so the question was um how do we prevent having a robot concept with um you know two fundamentally different things that that don't integrate well together um that's really the purpose of what we're doing in the later, the later part of the first week with design concepts and then what we do on that second Saturday of um, we have our requirements written out and we're putting the robot concept together as a team, as a design team. Um, and so we're talking about the integration aspects and how things are going to interface with each other and what things maybe need to pass through other things, et cetera, um, and trying to get ahead of those problems at that point in time um, so that we're, when we're exiting out of that day and we have our robot concept, we're confident that it's something that is not going to present, you know, fundamental integration issues. Um, and if we get to a point where we're finding that our requirements don't allow us to put a concept together that um, that <laughs> that integrates well, um, then that's maybe a point where we would stop and ask ourselves if our requirements are all correct. Um, you know, usually, I rarely that's the case where we run into that level of a problem. Um, usually, at the level of requirements we're writing, there is an architecture in there that's going to meet our requirements, but um, 
yeah the it's it's a it's not really about like having different people coming together with different ideas and trying to you know make them mesh it's about us as a design team looking at all of the different options that we've come up with and talking about how we could potentially integrate the best aspects of it or that there's a particular concept that's just so clearly better um, than all of the rest of them that we're just going to spend time refining that until we're confident. And, and from a high level, like team resource and team building thing, I, I've talked about this with, with some of the challenges that have been in previous games, like 2019, climbing the hat, getting onto hat mm -hmm. level three, very complex, took your entire robot architecture in a, in a lot of different solutions to be able to do it. But lots and lots and lots and lots of teams did it. So it was pretty easy. That is so totally incorrect. Yeah. That is just the wrong conclusion to draw from that. It was, you had to do it. That's what it really comes down to. Your design requirements and your initial strategic analysis of the game tell you what you have to do. If you are at a place where you have two uh, concepts that are very difficult to integrate, either you have to do it based on your design requirements or you don't. You have to make, you have to say, all right, this is absolutely necessary for the requirements that we have made. And we can't, and at this point, it's something that is possible. It just means more resources devoted to it. And other cases you'll say, we can't. We have to revisit the design requirements, but that's a lot rarer. Yeah. It, is, it is extremely rare in FRC that I've seen that you are so wildly off in what is possible to put together. You can fit stuff in places. <laughs> it's just going to require more work. Yeah. You know, you can have two robot spanning interfaces that need to use almost all of your footprint and height to be able to do two very separate tasks. That's most FRC robots that perform at a high level, climbing to level three and shooting uh, into the upper hub in um in yep. 2022 all of all of these sort of things that's part of why i don't like 2023 but like here's you have this whole thing to deal with these two separate concepts and if it's if it is important to your team you have to figure out what resources you need to devote to do it yeah i think the other aspect is that there's almost always multiple robot architectures that will satisfy the requirements it's just which ones are going to make certain aspects easier than others and trying to figure out which one is going to be um, the easiest to build to satisfy your requirements or the most performant or what have you. And remember, to build is every aspect of it, me electromechanical and yeah. programming. programming. Yeah. If it is talking about it, these, wherever your strength is, you can lean on that a little bit once you get to a really hard problem. If it's really, really, really difficult to integrate these two systems, maybe it's via programming. If you have, there were um, pass-through robots in 2019 mm -hmm. that had a full bar collector and then something to, to hold it. And that requires coordination, else you kabonk into yourself. And you can say we have confidence to be able to do that, or we don't. Yep. We have to solve it a different way. But... No. Yeah, we didn't talk about that. If you derive your robot concept from your strategy functions, does it matter? Ooh, that's a good one. Um, yes, I think it's. Imp I, I do think it's. Imp it's still helpful to create requirements, even if you never revisit them, because the process of creating those requirements still require, like, still involves everyone on the team coming to the same um, understanding of what you're moving forward with. Um, oh, I no. didn't. I didn't restate their question. Sorry. The question was. <laughs> you restate the question, then we'll restate the question. Okay. Okay. Um, so, sort of two parts of the question. First one is: if you never revisit your requirements, um, is it worth making them? Um, and then the second was: if you derive your robot concept from your strategy um requirements does it matter um so 
I guess I'm I'm assuming that the, by requirements you're talking about detailed requirements. Um, so yeah, I, I think there's still value in creating them even if you don't revisit them um, periodically. Um, I do think that you will get more value out of them by revisiting, even if you don't do it as frequently as you know as we do. Even if it's only like at the end of the season, you come back and you look and go, "Well, here's our requirements, and here's the robot that we developed, and you know we kind of got off track here, or you know we met all of our requirements, or whatever." Um, but the exercise of talking about and developing those requirements and thinking about what is an acceptable versus unacceptable solution is still a valuable exercise. Um, before moving forward, even if you never go back to it. Um, and, and in the same vein, does it matter if you create those detailed requirements versus just the, the strategy priorities? I mean, skipping steps, it's up to your team, basically. We find that there's value for us in going to that extra level of detail um, in terms of having that common understanding when we're talking about um, our prototypes results or um, the various options that we're looking at of what is and isn't good enough. Um, but it's also perfectly val valid to skip that step and just say, hey, we think that creating our priority list or our needs, wants, or whatever, and then going straight into figuring out a ro robot concept, like if that works for you, that's great, right? Skipping steps is totally fine as long as you acknowledge that you're skipping the step and what you may or may not lose by doing that. But it's six weeks is a very short amount of time. Um, so we we choose to spend basically an entire day, um, uh, our entire meeting working on developing our requirements um, because we find that it helps our process that much. And some of it comes down to um, how many and how often are your designers in your different mm. in your different robot um, disciplines meeting, meeting or to are talking. You can do a lot with a lot of implicit requirements mm -hmm. if the same people are there all the time and their understanding of the robot is updated every t the only time that the understanding of the robot is updated is when everybody's together and working on it so there's nobody left out yep. if it's more difficult for you to get communication across the different teams because uh different shifts or people are available different days or whatever and and they are heavily involved in things then having things written out and explicit can be very useful and there are some points even no matter how you do it implicit or explicit there's a point you're di you're deep down into this design you're doing or you're even past integration and you're working for hours on something and it's not achieving any of the goals <laughs> yeah. that you're trying to do so it can yep. it can be useful to stop before you get to that point where you're developing like an auto mode with a totally integrated system for something that you just not going to use or you're designing mm -hmm. for a requirement that isn't part of what your robot actually needs to be able to do and you don't realize it if you haven't written everything yeah. out and you you don't look at, back at it and you don't think about it good question anything else or something that was left about how long does it take us to design the robot after the mission is set so a uh, a 2910 specific question about how what our schedule is past primary geometry. Mm -hmm. um, Cadlock was the end of week four, right? Yeah, um, end of end of week four was when we um, had final final CAD for first version of the robot that we um, then released parts for manufacturing. So um, lathe parts get made in house. Um, hopefully some router parts this year now that we've got the router back up and running. Um, but uh, sheet parts go, uh, we're going to sponsor um, and then billet parts also going to sponsor um, 3D print parts, etc. cetera. So, um, and we have prioritized on this team um, having the whole robot CAD done complete before any parts get made. Um, I think with the exception of the some of the chassis parts we started making like a week early because we were locked down enough that nothing in there was changing. Well, so you can do that. So you can push these deadlines yep. in either direction, depending on what is going to work best for your team. Yep. You can have your design locked earlier. It means that you won't be able to explore as many avenues mm -hmm. as, in as much detail. 
but it can be worthwhile if you if it takes you longer to manufacture or assemble or to bring up. Yep. You still need a certain amount of time with the robot or robots. Um, and you can push it the other direction. If you can manufacture stuff instantly, if it's just going to show up the day after you send yeah. it out and your assembly and you spend some of that time making it so that your assembly is so well documented and so dead simple that you assemble it in a day there there was the the sheet metal craze of about a decade ago when a couple of teams with a really good process said this is the way we do it and then it then it tried to trickle out but you have to kind of have everything integrated for it to make sense to do it that way because ultimately you want like a week with the robot fully together before your first competition. And by to... fully together, you mean built, wired, software is brought up, like robot is running. Yes. So so individual software bring up, like you move one motor at a time until mm -hmm. everything's, you're sure that everything's working, and then you start controlling things subsystem by subsystem. Once you have everything controlled subsystem by subsystem, that's where you should have a week left. Just to, to integrate, to... Um, get your control scheme the way that you want it to start doing auto modes auto modes driver practice break a few things so some of it is working forward you don't get the game until kickoff yep so you can't do some for the okay hi sorry about the hotspot stuff um we had reached kind of our yeah the, the end of conclusion. Our time so uh thank you very much for showing up and asking live questions it really helps um Back next week.